Welcome everyone to Astronomy on Tap. <laughs> Number 31 and the last one of 2020. Oh, yeah. Good riddance to this year, am I right? <laughs> Ignore the live stream from my phone. <laughs> Everything's going all right. Start, I am MC Blue Moon Skater Girl and I am MC M33, who doesn't usually no, I make a lot of mistakes. Who am I kidding? <laughs> We're starters figuring out how to share the screen. <laughs> all right, so we are still doing trivia despite the different format. Um, this month it's about the history of modern astronomy in Hawaii. So as cool as it is to get all that science from those observatories, it is very sobering and I'm not gonna lie, kind of depressing how we actually get that science. So at bare minimum, you will learn a lot. Okay, so just a reminder um, to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps us a lot to get more views. And this is how we are doing astronomy on tap at the moment. Um, uh, the COVID edition. So um, please help us out and share with your friends. All right, be sure to follow us on social media so you can keep abreast of what we're doing. On Twitter, we are AOT underscore BCS. And on Facebook and Instagram, we are just AOT BCS. You can also go to astronomyontap.org slash events to see if there's an astronomy and tap that is maybe physically closer to you than we are. Okay, and you can also help support the Grand Stafford Theater, which is uh, the place that used to host us in person. And so you can tip the bartender in quotations. Um, so this would be an Venmo at Jose-Quintana-20, and you can put Stafford tip in the description. And this is just gonna help the place that has always supported us. So. Um, yeah, to be your bartenders, as always. Right, and if you would like to support us, you can help donate to us online, either on Venmo or Cash App, at AOT BCS, that is our tag. And if you donate $15, you will get an AOT shirt featuring the lovely space traveler you see pictured here with their cosmic beer. Okay, and as a reminder, our next event is January 20th, 2021. And that is the third Wednesday of every month. So January 20th, mark your calendars. All right, and remember, if you have any questions during our talks, be sure to put them in the live chat and we will answer them as best we can. And yes, don't wait and forget, that usually happens. So as soon as you think of a question, put it in the chat. And for this AOT, we're also having a special panelist um, burning questions panel. So you can ask questions about anything and we may also answer them today. Okay, right. and I forgot to ask, what are you drinking tonight? Oh, yes. Um, I'm drinking a beer called Hop Tongue. Whoop, where's my camera? There's my camera. Hop Tongue, very Rolling Stones inspired. I believe. I actually don't listen to much of the Rolling Stones. But I yeah, it is a good beer from Houston, I think. What are you drinking, Blue Moon Skater Girl? I am drinking this um, Christmas ale, which in the holiday spirit, I think you can see it then. Um, yes. Yeah, it kind of does taste Christmassy, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah. Perfect for this time of year. All right, so without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker, speaker Monica Vidori. So Monica, she has a really cool bio. I'm so excited to read it. Okay. <laughs> Monica is a recent graduate of George Mason University. Her degrees are in biology and government and international politics with a concentration in law, philosophy, and governance. Originally from San Antonio, Texas, Monica got tired of single-handedly fighting 30 to 50 feral hogs all day and moved to Washington, D.C. in 2017 to do an internship in the United States Senate. Once the government realized that she's built different, she ended up taking multiple jobs across the government, nonprofit sector, and even a science society 
doing work ranging from biodefense and national security to space policy, education, and playing Club Penguin on government computers. Monica now works at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where she created her own job title as astrobiologist and policy and ethics specialist, a job where she absolutely dominates in iMessage eight ball games against the aliens and occasionally goes to meetings and stuff. Monica is irrationally afraid of groups of teenagers and her favorite type of cheese is Gouda, which may I just say that is a Gouda choice. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, Monica, please take it away. Welcome. <laughs> Thank y'all so much and thanks for having me. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Can y'all see that all right? Uh, yes, looks good on my end. All right, perfect. So thanks so much again for having me. Um, first things first, I've got a drinking game for y'all. So feel free to screenshot, commit it to memory. Uh, I made a hard mode if you've had a particularly rough week. Um, and yeah, without further ado, let's get hydrated. So there's really two parts of the talk that I wanna talk about. The first is kind of the federal and international level stuff. Uh, the next is like the institutional and group level stuff, stuff that we could, do, that, that we could be doing more immediately. Um, but really what I want you to keep in mind for this entire talk is that a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about here uh, really is no longer science fiction. We really are planning to have like orbital moon bases and going to Mars and people are really talking about like Martian settlements and stuff like that. And even though that stuff is kind of far off, we will start to be seeing some of this stuff within our lifetime. So please keep that in mind. Now, at the heart of all, um, all of space law, all of space policy, really, and this is kind of the federal international stuff that I'm going to kick us off with, is the Outer Space Treaty. And basically says, be nice in space, no fighting in space, no weapons in space, uh, has to be for the good of all mankind, no harmful contamination, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's all well and good. But something that you've got to remember about international law is that it's non-binding. And so that's really tricky, because there's really no way to hold these actors accountable if they break these rules. And there's also also nothing saying that these actors also won't retaliate. So another thing that's particularly tricky about the Outer Space Treaty is stuff like harmful contamination, even weapons, um, they're not really well defined. Um, so they can be taken intentionally vaguely. And so that also kind of makes uh, the Outer Space Treaty a little bit tricky. The treaty also doesn't really account for the private sector. It's really talking about governments, talking about states. Um, so I would actually argue that the Outer Space Treaty is getting more ambiguous uh, as time goes on. Now, because of this, the space law landscape is really just barren, it's highly reactive, and it's dominated by the few actors that have been able to, you know, really dominate really in space exploration since, you know, the whole thing started. So it really is like the Wild West 2.0 up there, both in terms of coloniality and lawlessness. Um, and so, like I was saying before, all this stuff really isn't, um, it's, it's not science fiction anymore. Um, but, you know, when we talk about these big, you know, domination in space and stuff like that and, and keeping our lead in space, we also still have to stay humble. We haven't really mastered taking a shit in space, honestly. Um, and that's still kind of a problem for the astronauts, including the whole thing where your body kind of crumbles in on itself in microgravity. That's still a huge problem. We don't really know the effects of microgravity or non-Earth environments on human, plant, bacteria viral physiology. We have no idea how diseases could spread in other places. Healthcare and procedures in space, if you think about it, surgeries are pretty dependent on gravity as well, so how's that going to work? In situ resource utilization and the technologies for sustainably living on another planet are still many, many years away. And lastly, space is one of the last, if not the last, truly peaceful international collaboration. Even if you've taken one government course, you know that international relations can be kind of shaky with some countries, but space is the one thing that everybody is all in on, you know, no matter what. So kind of keep that in mind. I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about norms, which is pretty much the overriding principle of international law, all law really, I would argue. And a norm is an attitude that's accepted as right and appropriate by a large group of people. They are practiced and they are predictable. So this is like the heart of the laws that are being made. Uh, an example that I like to give is stealing somebody else's cart at the grocery store, right? It's, it's not in our constitution. Founding fathers didn't have Trader Joe's. It's not technically illegal what you're doing, but it's something that you just don't do. And you can, you can, you can even face repercussions for doing it. So we use a lot of different norms every day. Uh, 
like not cutting in line and stuff like that. Um, and so the norms that we have that we create on an individual level um, starts to take off and fit into the larger population, right? They're interwoven into everything that we do. Um, and the way that norms work into our policies also allow people to kind of get a snapshot of what a, a place is like just by the norms they employ. So when the norm in space is just, okay, kids play nice, but also don't be the weakest person in space and protect your assets and stuff like that, then you get this uh, sort of, of culture, this sort of landscape that's extremely tense. And it's like, you know what, I'm gonna play nice. I'll put my guns down. But the minute somebody flinches, you've got to act to protect your best interests as well. And so that's not really sustainable. And so when you have uh, Congress people saying things like American exceptionalism and domination space, the White House talking about American dominance on the final frontier, uh, it's not really good. It's not really a good look to the people that we uh, collaborate in space with as well, because people are like, what the heck, you know, I thought we were in this together. Remember in the law landscape, what you say can and will be held against you. So this is especially detrimental. Um, going on to attitudes a little bit. Uh, yeah, Elon Musk. Um, you know, he's not a congressman. He's not like, you know, in, in the government or whatever. He's not a direct representative, but he is representative of what space in America is like. And so when he's saying we're going to coup whoever we want, that's also a huge red flag. Um, and then we have people, uh, Dimitri Rogozin, the head of Roscosmos, for example, said of the American Artemis program, quote, they see their program not as international, but as similar to NATO. Uh, they, they see us and they think, you know, there is America, everyone else must help and pay. And honestly, we're not interested in participating in such a project. Now, take it with a grain of salt, of course, but the sentiment is true. You know, we're kind of not wanting to share our sandbox here. Um, and that's how dangerous even, you know, just the word dominance, you know, that's how dangerous it could be. So another quick story I'll tell, um, bring that up, yeah. So uh, the Bereshit lander, uh, there was a company in Israel that wanted to send a lunar lander, do some awesome science, great stuff. They even sought out the uh, NASA Planetary Protection Office to make sure that they're decontaminating right. Excellent norms to set. Uh, until this guy, Nova Spivak, who his company is about creating a backup of the human race, put human DNA and tardigrades, living beings, onto the lunar lander. And unfortunately, the lander crashed. So then Nova had to come out and say, by the way, I put life on the lander and nobody knew about it. And so this created such a, a outrage, I guess, or a panic with space policy specialists and space lawyers and stuff like that, because it really highlighted that, you know, the private sector doesn't really have to abide by the same rules that states do um, in the Outer Space Treaty. And so uh, we have a uh, lawyer here from the University of Nebraska saying, you know, we got to ask ourselves what kind of norms and behavior are we going to set by what we approve to space? So there's the private sector asset, uh, aspect of space ethics. And then there's ashes on the moon. And there's, um, the sanctity of celestial bodies as sacred or religious objects. So there are human ashes on the moon. There's even a startup, there's at least one startup in Silicon Valley that advertises sending your loved ones ashes to the moon, which you might think, okay, that's a little out there, but you know, it is what it is, I guess. Um, but what not anybody at NASA failed to realize was that this is particularly disrespectful to American indigenous communities and specifically the Navajo Nation. Not one person thought about this, right? And so NASA was kind of sent into a panic, you know, we got to figure this out, we got to quickly apologize and stuff like that. So that also creates um, you know, something for us to think about here, we like to say that space is for all, you know, we carry that sentiment a lot in. This sort of solidifies the idea that our definition of all is exclusionary, you know, or rather it's of pointed inclusion, really. So, and then there's a whole bunch of other questions in terms of search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, messaging extraterrestrial extraterrestrial intelligence and settling elsewhere and you know who's going to call the shots what are they going to look like economically how is it going to be governed who's going to represent humanity how you know who's going to decide how humanity is represented if we contact aliens or get contacted by them does alien life have rights even if they're tiny little microbes somewhere else does humanity have an inherent right to live on other worlds and should our life persist even if it means moving to other worlds and potentially destroying their climate every so often kind of like we're doing now um is what we do in space automatically for the good of humankind and how do we ensure we don't take humanity's worse into space um i personally don't think an economy that crashes every so often that's sustained by conflict is particularly sustainable for space um but that's just me and you know these are conversations that need to happen right it's more than just American democracy and American capitalism that exists on earth and that is interested in space. So how do we go together and how do we leave behind the worst of it, right? So these are by and large, you know, political, moral, ethical, philosophical questions uh, that we're starting to answer like right now.
So, you know, we got to come back to the central idea that, you know, no one agency, company or nation can tackle space alone. This stuff is hard. And that's why it's remained peaceful for all this time. Humanity also has some pretty bad habits when it comes to exploration and having like these tunnel vision goals and, and you know, exploiting people. So is the need to be the exception or to dominate, you know, worth giving up international collaboration and peace? And is there a way we can proceed fully while dismantling institutions of coloniality, right? Is this worth conflict? And you might be thinking, great, like this is all cool and all, but I don't work at the federal level, right? I don't work at the international level. I sit behind a computer screen. I'm a geologist. I lick rocks. That's totally fine. But what we can also do, and this is kind of the, the second part of the talk that I wanted to talk about, is the stuff that we could do more immediately on the individual, on the group, on the institutional level. Um, and that is the norms we set that will propagate up to the federal and international levels. So let's take a look at the fun and joy of academia. Um, so this is a, a note from the Office of the Director at Goddard Space Flight Center where I work and it's in 1970 and it's basically telling the women on center that you, you shouldn't wear pantsuits because it's not ladylike. Um, yeah, and so we also had beauty pageants at NASA that they went away in the 1970s. Um, but the thing, if, if you're not in academia, the thing that you should know is that people don't really retire, especially at NASA. So you have a lot of the same people that were doing these things still working at NASA. And you can kind of see this reflected in the current makeup of the civil servant workforce at NASA. And it is even worse uh, when we look at ethnic demographics and disability demographics as well. So that's what we're dealing with here. Um, also in academia, you know, the bar is set incredibly high just to get into grad school. And it's a very, very stressful experience. I actually just finished applying to grad school and I hate it every second. Um, and there's also grad schools and, you know, other places of employment asking to rank students emotional stability and just having just these crazy, you know, blatant discriminatory practices here. Um, and if you're on social media, the hashtag academic chatter can also highlight some of these issues for you. So often in our circles, especially in space science, we, we feel like we have to choose between a fulfilling career, a high salary, uh, a work-life balance, but we can never really have all three and that's severely damaging. We like to talk a lot about the leaky pipeline in academia, how, how people flow out at every different uh, educational level. But that's total bullshit. Like it's it's not passively leaky. It's actively pushing people out. Like the high cost of attendance, people that don't retire, and they're still you know blatant sexist, you know stuff like that. And so we we use this language, right? They fell through the cracks. They weren't cut out for academic life. But the reality is that these students are being failed by the department, the institution, mentorship, et cetera, et cetera. And these this is stuff that anybody who's been in the academic mill are all pretty painfully aware of. So how do we start to fix all this? The first is our self-assessment. And this is the goals, the values, and the culture that we want to have, right? So we have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of culture do we want to become? What precedents do we want to set? What's missing from the landscape that we can add? Next is how we implement this stuff. And we use what's called the science traceability matrix. This is our accountability the actions that we take and how we cultivate the norms that we want to have. So this is early practices of the norm and ensuring uh, accountability. So how do we set the example for what we want to set? So what is the science traceability matrix? This is kind of how I see it in my head. Some people see it as a flow chart. It's really up to you, but here's what I've got going on in my little pea brain. It starts with the big picture up here. Um, you've got like your big, big picture question and then you work out all the details like um, tools you're gonna use, you know, what, what models you're gonna use and stuff like that. The people that you're gonna bring on to the project uh, until you reach the very end, which is your mission completion. And you can apply the science traceability matrix to, you know, multi-billion dollar space telescopes or, you know, whatever little, you know, research that you're doing kind of on the side. So. Let's say, for example, that you're building a state-of-the-art ground-based facility, right? A ground telescope, and it's going to do some awesome, awesome science. Um, you've already poured resources into building it, the money into building it. Um, but then you realize you're building it on native land, and they're not particularly happy that you're building on that particular site that you're building on. So what happens? You've already started to pour resources into building the thing. You've already put money into it, and now you've got people sitting in on the land and protesting. Let's also say, for example, that you're building this awesome state-of-the-art telescope that's gonna go into space and you bring in a private company to do it, uh, but you're not on the same page in terms of policies, in terms of communications, in terms of the practices of how you're gonna actually go through this stuff. Um, 
so you're, you're kind of left on uneven terms right here. And so you end up getting set back years and years and years. You end up getting set back by billions of dollars. Congress is pissed off at you. And if those two examples sound familiar, that's quite literally what's happening with JWST and the 30 meter telescope at Mauna Kea. Now, both of these, both of what's happening here are very, very nuanced. There, there's a lot more than ha happening than the examples that I pulled out, but you could definitely pull examples out of this uh, in terms of what happens when you leave policy and communication and ethics and all that stuff at the the end of your project, you face delays, uh, you face, you know, monetary headaches, you face, you know, having to scramble to figure out all this stuff. So not only is it really going to hold you back in terms of money and time and stuff like that, but you're also kind of telling the world that, you know, I don't really prioritize this stuff. I don't really prioritize the people that do science, right? And science doesn't just appear, people do science. So that's also kind of a really crappy thing that you're telling the world here. So what you got to do is start to implement these practices early into the science traceability matrix. You want to have everybody on the same page, right? You want to have everybody, you know, kind of doing the same thing and up to the same standards. And you want to reinforce that throughout the mission. So you're going to end up with your ethics. You're going to have your new norms, you're going to set the example, you're going to be able to control the culture of how this develops if you start to do this stuff early on. You're going to have new standards of communication and this all adds up to an efficient, effective and new standard setting project. All for three easy payments of 19, no, I'm just playing. But really what you want to make sure is that you're also kind of, you know, not only thinking about the ways you can avoid all those headaches, but also what you want to tell the world and what kind of examples that you want to set. This is how you put it into practice. Next, we wanna look at the Artemis generation, young millennials, Gen Z, all of us out here. And we wanna think in terms of our leadership, our interdisciplinarity and how we communicate. We are the first generation where we were kind of taught the earth is not as big as we think it is, right? Like we're, we're zooming with a bunch of different people right now, right? We could check the weather on Mars and all that. And that's totally awesome. So, you know, given the projects we're going to inherit and the new science that we're going to accomplish, how can we use the uniqueness of uh, the next generation to speak up and speak out? So how can we actively get involved in shaping law? Now, there's another component to thinking about the next generation that I want us to think about, and that's who we keep in our circles. Um, so often in the academic world, we have to prioritize, uh, you know, where the results are. If somebody is just a terrible person, like they're openly racist, openly sexist or whatever, but they write good proposals and they bring in money, oftentimes for some people, and it really shouldn't be like this, but oftentimes it's a no brainer. People will pick that person um, just because we don't get a lot of funding. And like I sort of get it, I guess. But what you're doing by keeping these people on your team is you have to think about everybody else that you are actively pushing away, you know, from these opportunities. When I was applying to grad school, I knew that there were places that I didn't want to go because of the people that they chose to keep, right? Word gets around, especially in academia. So you got to really ask yourself, like, what are you really telling the next generation and historically excluded voices when you refuse to speak up? Do you want to have workshops on how to talk to the racist or do you want to fire them? Like, it's, it's really that simple. Are you prioritizing the next generation and setting them up for success at every turn? And this comes back to the idea of, you know, what do you want to tell the world about your lab and yourself? What norms do you want to set here? And lastly, we have the global consensus. So we want to have a science minded society, our new norms in place, and we want to ensure that space is for all, right? So this is our part in science and our actions integrated in society, right? And if this all sounds like some extra steps, it's definitely because it is, right? You know, we all kind of chose science in some form or fashion to improve the lives of others and to advance humanity via our research. However, we have to realize that the definition of what's good for all is not universal right now. And our science is not inherently good or helpful. Just because we launch something doesn't mean it's helpful or good or just or whatever. So we have to hold ourselves accountable and hold our science and definitions of progress accountable. So yeah, like we should be playing, we should be placing extra steps on ourselves um, and all that good stuff. So it all comes back to the reality of what science is. And science is has never been void of politics. And I, on, I honestly get really aggravated when I see, you know, take, take politics out of science. Science is a social and political enterprise. It's politics that decides who gets to become a scientist. It's politics that defines what a scientist is. It's politics that funds science, right? It's politics that decides what science is, which, which fields and what kind of science is prioritized at the end of the day, right? So, you know, 
we like to think of science as this sort of rational and objective, you know, kind of untouchable universal truth or whatever. But keep in mind that science is only rational and objective within this framework of science that was built off of, quite frankly, racist ideals, right? For example, the eugenicists of the Nazis were literally modeled off of the quote unquote scientific study of the inferiority of American slaves and indigenous peoples, right? Hitler literally praised the way America treated its indigenous peoples. And of course, science doesn't belong to the West and many indigenous communities have contributed to science. But right now in America, our academic framework does not reflect this. Uh, it does not all honor this knowledge and it continues to be led by sexual abusers, Neil deGrasse Tyson, sexist, Richard Feynman, homophobes, James Webb, and eugenicists like Richard Dawkins. So it's, it's kind of a sad reality that we have to think about here. Our own declaration of independence, right, even employs a very specific word choice given the context of who was classified as a man in 1776, right? So you can't really be objective within this framework. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, how did this framework start? How did these detrimental cultural norms and academia take root? Uh, and if you want to get started on that, I'd recommend starting with the creation of the printing press in Europe. Um, and why is it such that these cultural norms seemingly cannot be challenged? Like, what is it about academia that keeps these norms very much alive? Um, and something that I think we should ask ourselves is what are we doing in our day to day to keep these norms alive and what can we be doing to start dismantling them. So, you know, space science can only do so much. And I'm not saying that we have to pause everything and fix centuries upon centuries of oppression, um, you know, so that we can move on. Like that's, that's pretty impossible right now. But it's not only irresponsible, it's dangerous, right? To go forward into space exploration without the necessary self-reflection and without designing our exploration processes or, and our scientific processes so that we can begin to dismantle these systems, right? It's a design feature as much as it is an individual feature as well. And it's even more critical that we do this right now now. We definitely have to ask ourselves why over the span of 60 years, just over 60 years, why this picture looks the same, why nothing really has changed, right? So, you know, we have a much, much bigger voice than we know, and we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to carry this on with us? So even if you feel like you play only a small or unrelated part, you'll be just as much a part of how history is shaped because of how you act or because of how you refuse to act right here and right now in your career. So are we really okay with leaving things as is and hoping that you know the policy will figure itself out later, knowing what that means for humanity and especially knowing what that means for the most disenfranchised groups? So some final takeaways, you know, number one, think about the socio-political, cultural, economic, and ethical implications of the work you're doing early into the project planning process, advertise them and continuously follow up on them. Number two, academic institutions are not going to become ethical by themselves and change does not happen without pressure. So don't be scared if something isn't in place, you're gonna make it a thing. Do you think these universities dropped the GRE out of the sheer goodwill of their hearts? They dropped the GRE because they were cyber bullied to shit. So, hey, it works, you know. And then lastly, actions are greater than words, right? Hire social scientists, hire DNA consultants, you know, put ethics in your proposal, pay people for their time and actually walk the walk. And, you know, some things if you want to get started, you can comb through policies to see how they could yield detrimental results, comb through the language that you use, don't use colonization as a good light or destiny or manned or unmanned. Um, the, the importance of language is really a separate talk in itself, but this is an amazing article that you should read if you want to uh, have some more information about like how important language is. It's on the Atlantic, I believe. Um, Stop freaking forming DNI groups if you don't have solid actionable goals. Oh my goodness, academia loves its think groups and all that stuff. Stop taking away from already formed grassroots initiatives and just shut up. Just please shut up. Like think about what, whose voices that you're uh, highlighting, the ideas that you're highlighting, just really just shut up. And you know, if a good rule of thumb that I have, if it, you see something and it looks like it could end up on an episode of Black Mirror, it's, it's highly likely that it's not ethical. Um, okay, so this is the part where I monologue. Are y'all ready? I'm not. One second. Hmm. Okay, so <laughs> similar to our norms, you know, our imagining of the next endeavor in space and the continuation of the human race and all that stuff, the conditions of it, the words that we use to describe it, all contribute to the manifestation of these ideas when these things happen, and they are going to happen sooner than we think. 
You can refuse to acknowledge current policies at your department or your institution level, and that leads to deterring generations of entire groups of people from participating in science. You know, you can refuse to acknowledge the words that we use, uh, the bad features of our society that have gone unchallenged. Um, and we can assume that all these things are just gonna be carried on into another endeavor. You know, we can refuse to acknowledge these words and assumptions as a symptom of a bigger thing that needs to be addressed for all humanity. And what that leads to is ensuring that these injustices no happen happen no matter what, right? It almost leads us to wanting these things to carry on if they go unchallenged. And of course, these off-world societies haven't happened yet. There's no native populations on Mars for us to physically colonize. Nobody's working 725 an hour at the Martian McDonald's so they can barely afford their SpaceX brand oxygen for the month yet. Um, but, you know, despite how, and you know, of course, despite how dismally misrepresented STEM is, you know, we still accomplish things, we still get things done. Um, but refusing to challenge what we have on earth only ensures that these ideals are gonna carry on and we know how well they worked out on earth for us. You know, we're only limiting ourselves here and we shouldn't be spectators of our own history being written. Um, and I think space exploration is such a good platform for us to begin to unravel this. And that's the whole reason that I do this, yeah. You know, it's so cool because I know I I have like friends and family watching from the non-science circles. Um, and it's really cool because it's a physical representation of the way that space impacts us all, right? Even those not directly involved. Space exploration um, has always been about, you know, imagining and picturing a better future for humanity. And we can see that a lot in sci-fi as well, right? And if we want to keep the notion that space is for all, then the priority should be that all, right? And what does that mean? We need to unpack what our goals here and where these goals even come from. So, you know, whether it feels like on whether it feels like it or not, all eyes really are on us, right, as, as the nerds here. We're not spectators and nor should we be. And so this is a time for us to be not only an example, but a force for this change, right? So space exploration is nothing if not a little daring. And I think as scientists, you know, we've all kind of got a little bit of that save the world in us, right? And so like, you know, what's this moment in history if not a golden opportunity for us to like shake things up, learn from our past while like actively shaping our future and to finally, finally do things right. Thank you all so much for having me. And I would love to take your questions now. Oh, that, that was such a great talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Bree, talking to non-science folks. Um, yeah, I know it was a part, like only a small part of your talk, but thank you for articulating the problems with academia so nicely. <laughs> because I, I sometimes struggle to tell, talk about my family to like about that and yeah. I'm really excited to share this talk with them they're in, most of them are in India so they can't watch it right now so, but okay <laughs> yes and I am not gonna lie if I drank every time you said something that I I was learning about I would be drunk right now so I kinda have let's to go <laughs> But amazing, amazing talk. Like, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think thank I you. learned a lot. And also it kind of just kind of stated things that are in my mind that are just like, I just want to yell out to the universe. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, before we had an audience questions, I completely forgot, forgot to ask. Monica, what are you drinking tonight? Oh, so I made a peach sweet tea. And oh. it's McDonald's sweet tea, deep eddy sweet tea vodka, peach oh. syrup. Um, and more vodka. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cheers. <laughs> yes, cheers to that. Cheers, y'all. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Oh, I guess we can. I can take so it first. Do you want to yeah. ask the first question? Can do. Okay, this question is from Curtis Hunt in the chat. If celestial bodies, like the moon, are sacred to some groups, why does that not forbid exploring these bo those bodies? That's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, so from what I understand, and to be honest, this is something that I actually, this is not my area of expertise. Um, and I can get you some papers. Um, there are a few authors whose names are escaping me that they've written more about this stuff. Um, indigenous, yeah, like uh, centering indigenous cultures in uh, space exploration. I'm pretty sure if you Google it, you could, you could find some papers there. But from what I understand, it's the spread, it's the human remains, right? It's, it's the, like uh, the contamination without really like, you know, having or serving like a purpose or doing something like greater than that it's it's kind of I think it has to do with that part um as opposed to like science um but again I I'm not the I'm not really the expert on that but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what that is gotcha okay good question all right uh this one's from the cosmic kid 
he'll be speaking right after you. <laughs> As an astronomy educator, how can I introduce ethical principles in my classes or during outreach? That's a really good question. So I would highly recommend including more indigenous, like putting more indigenous knowledge. Um, and so like kind of introducing people to more than just, you know, this is what Galileo saw, this is what these people saw. And that's really awesome. Like, don't get me wrong, but there's, thousands and thousands of years of and so many indigenous cultures that have like contributed to space uh, and have done some amazing things. So including that into your uh, curriculum would be amazing. Um, sorry, let me read the question again. Could ethical practice? Yeah, absolutely. And also having just discussions about this stuff as well. You know, we have all these different problems on Earth. It's hard to ignore. And so, you know, just kind of asking the question and kind of raising these concerns. Um, you don't have to go like super in depth and stuff like that, but just getting the idea in their heads of, you know, oh my gosh, like what if we carry these bad things or how do we carry the good things, you know, stuff like that. So having these conversations, I think are very, very helpful as well. Great question. Yeah, Ooh. great for bringing awareness too because a lot of people just aren't aware about what is happening, so. Yeah. Um, so we have one question from Derek Anderson. Have you read the Kim Stanley Robinson Mars trilogy? If so, what do you think? I have not, I've heard of it. I'm gonna write that down so I can read it actually okay got it <laughs> i'll let you know have a lot of questions coming in so. <laughs> it's all good <laughs> i love it yeah um diago arzua asks what advice would you have from scientists in non-space or for not scientists in non-space fields that still want to be part of these conversations Oh, I love this question. Y'all got to raise some hell. Y'all got to put the fire under our asses. We need people from other circles, you know, speaking up to us. Because again, we're, we're doing all this for y'all. Like we, we kind of are doing the whole like space exploration and like the next steps of humanity on all that bullshit. We're doing this for y'all. So, you know, give us your input. Like we, we need people speaking to us about this. And I think a lot of why these conversations can sometimes hit dead ends in, this, in the space science realms um, is because, you know, we're kind of in our own like echo chamber here and that's extremely detrimental to these conversations we need people coming up and being like like slapping us in the face like hey we got to figure this shit out and if we can get that from as many people as possible like that would be amazing so you know um there's a ton of people that like write about space as ethics and stuff like that and so if y'all can um number one like Honestly, like just writing some papers about it too. Like it's, it's not as scary as you think, but we'd love to get this kind of input. We'd love to have conversations with it. And so like, if you want to talk to certain people, if you want to like write certain papers, let me know, I can help you with that. But I mean, get your voice out there any way that is like the most accessible to you. Talk with people at your local universities and stuff like that. Like we really, really need input from the humanity that we are literally serving right now. So. Amazing. Yeah, I guess that kind of answers the first question from Marco Vidari. Which <laughs> hey, bro. The medical field could <laughs> get involved. Um, but a second question, when are you running for president? And Dark Matter Dude would also like to know. Marco, I swear to God. Um, <laughs> so this is my brother, and I'm pretty sure he's trolling me right now. <laughs> um, so thanks for your question, bro. We, we also absolutely need the medical community because when I took all like the concentration of my all my ethics courses and my bioethics courses were around the medical community. And so that's also going to be one of our biggest like a, a growing field of astrobiology is actually, you know, space medicine. Um, and so keeping sustaining human life in space and off world is going to be a huge thing. So the medical community, I, be, I believe, absolutely should be a part of these discussions as well. Um, so that's a great point. Um, President, I'll keep you posted. I'm way too wild on Twitter to do political <laughs> things. So, you know, I'll, I'm just kind of coasting along. You know me. <laughs> on that note, before we let you go, uh, what is your Twitter handle? Oh, geez. Okay. I have <laughs> type, it's Astro Traviesa, which is troublemaker in Spanish. Um, <laughs> I, <love that. laughs> I, I threw it in the chat for y'all. So <laughs> awesome. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. See you at the burning panels, which burning questions panel, not the burning panel. Goodness. Uh, <laughs> it's in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Y'all in a bit. Okay. Bye. Bye. That was so exciting. But up next, we have um, What's Up with the Cosmic Kid, one of my favorite sections or segments, I should say. Hey, Cosmic Kid, what are you drinking tonight? Hey, what's up? I've got a lovely hot toddy. 
It's, it's very delicious and also very empty. So this is just a prop at this point. Nice. Well, we're ready to hear what we should be looking at tonight. So awesome. All right. Hello, Astro Nuts. Welcome to What's Up, the segment where I talk about what's up in the sky that you can watch this month. So for the December 2020 edition, we got a couple of fun things. First up, we got the thing that a lot of y'all have probably been hearing about, the great conjugation or great conjunction, sorry, of Jupiter and Saturn. So you're probably thinking, hey, I've, I've seen this all over my Twitter feed. What's going on with this? Well, basically, conjunction is basically a word that combines different words or phrases, clauses, and sentences together. Um, or in astronomy, it basically means that Jupiter and Saturn are going to be really, really close together in the sky, only about 0.01 degrees apart. To get an idea of how close that is, if you hold your thumb out at arm's length and point it up at the sky, the width of your thumb is going to be about one degree. So it's going to be about one hundredth of the size of that off in the sky. So it's going to be, you know, pretty, pretty close together in the sky. Um, this is also known as a great conjunction of 2020. Uh, and basically, a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, this is crazy because this conjunction is happening on the solstice. Maybe something weird is going on in the sky. Maybe the world's ending. Maybe, I don't know, some monster is going to awaken. None of that's going to happen. Conjunctions happen all the time. Um, what's really happening is that Jupiter and Saturn um, are sort of traveling off in their own orbits around the sun. And every now and then, they just look to be close together from our point of view on Earth. But there's nothing actually heavenly going about this. This is just random coincidence, a really cool coincidence, but a random coincidence. What is interesting, though, is that the last time there was a conjunction this close together with Jupiter and Saturn, was in 1623. Unfortunately, this happened during the Jupiter and Saturn work during the daytime around this time of the year, which means that nobody can actually see it. The last time somebody can see a great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn was actually in 1226. So it's been several hundred years since, since we've seen anything like this. And it'll be several hundred years again before anybody sees Jupiter and Saturn do this thing again. So I highly recommend if um, hopefully the, the the sky is clear wherever you are on December 21st, but I highly recommend you go out there and take a look. Um, you can also, sorry, NASA wrote a really great article with tips and tricks on observing it and even tips on how to photograph it, either with the cell phone camera or if you have a really nice camera, some tricks on um, tips and tricks on how to do, take pictures of it with a really nice camera. Because obviously you gotta do it for, you gotta do it for the gram, right? Um, and I made a link for y'all to check that out at tx.x slash conjunction. I'll also be tweeting that out and we'll put that in the chat for y'all to check out. The next thing I wanna talk about is the quadranitid meteor shower. I think I said that right. It goes on from mid-December to mid-January and it peaks um, just after the new year. Um, and that's basically around the time you probably wanna go look at it because and, you know, right now you're not gonna see much, but if you go out just after the new year, early in the morning, we're talking about three, 4 a.m., you'll see, you'll hopefully see, if you're in a sufficiently dark site, you'll hopefully see some meteors flying through the sky. You want to look to the north. So look for Polaris, which is in the tip of Ursa Minor, also known as the Little Bear, also known as the Little Dipper. And if you look just to the side of it, you'll that's where most of the meteors will come from. But it'll sort of fill up that entire sky region. So you don't really need to look in a particular part. You just sort of need to look north um, right after the new year around, around 4 a.m. You know what? Most of you are going to be up on New Year's, you know, January 1st anyway, um, around midnight. So instead of going to sleep at midnight, just stay up until 4 a.m. and go look for some meteors. That could be that could be a fun way to celebrate the new year. The last thing I want to talk about is this is going to be a little more challenging um, thing to find. You're going to want either binoculars or a telescope to look for this one because it's going to be difficult to do with your naked eye unless you're at a sufficiently dark site. But Mesley 41 is a fun thing to look at. It's a pretty young cluster of stars, only about 200 million years old, which sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty freaking young. And it's about 100 stars. It's viewed throughout December and January, um, right around between you know, 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. And you can easily view it with binoculars or a telescope. So, you know, it's going to start setting around 4 a.m. So, you know, hey, you're already up looking at meteors on the morning of January 1st at, at 3 a.m. anyway. Take out a pair of binoculars. So if you have a telescope, take out your telescope, go look for Canis uh, Majoris, which is just south of Orion, which is a beautiful constellation. It's very easily recognizable. And it's right next to Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky. So it should be really easy to find. And if you've got binoculars, you could probably see Sirius and M41 in the same field of view anyway. 
So you might as well not start the new year off by looking at M41 and looking at for some meteors. And I can't think of a better way to, to start the brand new year. And that, my friends, is what's up. That gets a seal of approval from me. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know how you do it so fast. <laughs> got another boo in the chat, but I am applauding. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much, Cosmic Kid. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited for the Jupiter Saturn conjunction. It's been like, I don't know what you, I mean, admittedly here in College Station, it's been clouded over for the past five days, it feels like. So we haven't been able to see it, but Jupiter and Saturn have been inching closer and closer together. And that's been really cool to see. They're very bright. Yeah. Well, next up, we have Dark Matter Dude with In the News. And Dark Matter Dude, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking boxed rosé. 2020 mood. No mixing. <laughs> straight out, straight out of the bag. Works just as well. <laughs> well. I, I was trying to come up. I couldn't come up with a pun. Thank you for sharing your screen. I'm going to mute now. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, hi everybody. Um, welcome to In the News. Um, there are two things you need to know, need to know about me. Um, one, my name is Dark is Dark Matter Dude, and number two is that I'm a lightweight, and this is my second drink. So here we are. We're on this adventure together. Let's go. Uh, cool. Okay. Um, so our first story is a very sad story. Um, the RC, the RCO radio telescope um, collapsed. Basically, there's no, there's not a great way, uh, another way to put this. Uh, so this is the the radio telescope that's been featured in lots of movies. Uh, Contact, Goldeneye, um, like 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 it, it's the radio dish, big 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 radio dish telescope that that you'll that you'll see in movies. Um, it's been involved in a whole bunch of really important scientific discoveries. The very first exoplanet, which is actually um, orbiting a pulsar, was discovered using this telescope. Um, this telescope is very good at, uh, once asteroids are detected, um, you, can point, you can point the telescope at it and basically track its orbit very, very precisely, which is useful for, I don't know, when we find something and want to figure out if it's going to crash into Earth. Um, so yeah, so, um, on August 10th, um, the, a support cable snapped um, and the NSF uh, started, essentially started de decommissioning the telescope. Um, they basically made the assessment that with the current level of funding that it was getting, um, you, you couldn't, you couldn't re really re repair it. Um, and then on December 1st, the platform, uh, the, a, a main cable crashed and then the platform collapsed basically. And so that's the images of the, dev the devastation that you're seeing um, in the bottom right. Now, some, so, now, so this is a very sad story, and, but something that's, that is missing from a lot of the coverage of this that I think is actually super important is the fact that Puerto Rico is not counted as a state and is a US territory. Um, and the reason that, the, that like, this, this is actually like super important for Arcebo is because um, there are historical examples of senators um, basically lobbying Congress and, and getting using their political power to get more funding for scientific projects in their state. Uh, the, the Green Bank um, radio telescope is actually a perfect example of this. So in, in Green Bank, West Virginia, um, that tel telescope was falling apart as well. The senator from West Virginia at the time um, basically went around Congress and said, hey, I need money to fix this. They gave it to him and the Green Bank Telescope lives to this day. Um, and the fact that Purdue is not a state and is not represented by voting members in Congress plays a role in the fact that RCBO collapsed. That's just, that's just facts. Um, okay, onto some, some lighter news. Um, whoops, we left our trash out. Um, so basically astronomers um, discovered a small object that passed, by, that passed right by Earth on December 1st uh, came really close to us, uh, only missed us by about 50,000 kilometers. Um, but one of the really weird things was that its orbit at that point was almost exactly the same 
as Earth's. Like its orbital phase was, was clocked on right, right on, um, which is really weird unless it's something that we put there, specifically a rocket booster that um, did, it, did its job boosting the rocket and then fell, and then fell off. Um, and so if you, if you track its orbit backwards in time, um, they actually found that it coincided with a Surveyor 2, with a Surveyor 2 lunar mission that was launched in September 1966. So this thing got launched in 1966, rocket booster falls off, completed a massive orbit around the sun, and then synced back up with us for us to find it. And then it was just there. And we found, we, we found it again. Uh, and then during a close pass, uh, this was confirmed using spectroscopy. So they, so they, so they pointed a telescope at it, dispersed the light, um, just like just like the prism in Pink Floyd, and the elements that were that were in this thing didn't look like an asteroid, but looked pretty close to what a rocket looks like. And so we were pretty sure that, that that's what this was. Uh, great. Last story: um, a Planet Nine-like orbit. This is something that's really cool. So Planet Nine is a theoretical Neptune mass planet that is predicted to be in the solar system, but we have not found it yet. So we're not talking about Pluto. I'm tabling Pluto for, for a bit. We're talking, about, we're talking about a theoretical planet that we haven't observed yet that's massive. It's a Neptune mass. Uh, now the evidence for this, it's a little bit tenuous, but basically if you look at the orbits of objects that are out past Neptune, Normally you'd expect those types of objects to kind of just like have all kinds of random orbit orientations, but actually there's a clustering of them that are, that are all pretty aligned. And people um, kind of take that signal as, oh, there's a really big planet that, that came in on its orbit, interacted with all these tinier bodies and aligned their orbits with it, basically. Now, the, the, the problem, and what you need to do to have this happen is that it would, it's pre, it would be predicted to have an, a really elliptical long, so like, so like several tens of thousands of years pure period and a very tilted orbit. So most, most of the planets are basically aligned in the, same, in the same plane, the same plane that Earth orbits around the sun in. Um, planet nine is orbited to be very, is predicted to be very tilted. But we, we've found something in another stellar system that actually looks a lot like this. So this, this is HD 106906. Um, and it, they used Hubble Space Telescope data to basically take a picture of the planet in, 20, in 2004, waited 13 years for it to move a little bit. And then you, using those two Hubble Space Telescope images, estimated what the orbit is. And that, that planet is very currently very far out from its star. It has an orbital period of 15,000 years, and it's tilted relative to the protoplanetary disk that surrounds the star. So basically, the fact that this thing exists kind of implies that planet nine is a more reasonable thing. It's not, it's not this really, it doesn't have this really weird orbit that there's no way it could have happened. There's no way that would happen in nature. Now we've found something that looks like planet nine's orbit, which lends credence to the idea that planet nine exists. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And then lastly, I end with a really just a fun picture to look at. This is from the Daniel K. Inoue, uh solar telescope, DKIST. It's a four meter telescope that they put on the top of a, of a volcano and then pointed it straight at the sun. Fantastic idea. I love it. Uh, there was a sunspot that happened uh, that happened on the sun sometime in December. I forget the exact date, but basically they, they took this amazing picture of it. Um, and so we just get to stare at this for three, two, one, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And that is what's up. Now what's up? No, oh, I took the wrong line. Wow. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh no, yeah, someone's really mad at me now. I'm sorry. It's, it's fine. We're you all know. struggling. <laughs> yeah, I was so that's, impressed. That's, that's what happened in the news. <laughs> that dekissed image. I was I'm surprised it wasn't doing the rounds like the like one of the first dekissed images that came out where they were like the granules are the size of Texas. I don't know. Maybe sunspots are less exciting than granules the size of Texas. I don't know. <laughs> All right.
Well, okay. so up next, I'm going to invite all of our panelists. So please show your, reveal yourselves. So <laughs> for our burning questions panel, we have um, Alex, Dark Matter Jude, Darini, MCM33, Monica, our invited speaker who did amazing, and um, the Cosmic Kid, Yaswan. So thank you all for being here. And I just want to mention one couple of things before we start is that first, um, none of the panelists have seen the questions that I'm about to ask. Um, I know the questions. I don't know which ones I'm going to ask yet. So TBD. Um, there, there's some good ones. There are some scary ones. And the second thing is that you can ask questions right now in our YouTube or Twitter. Um, you can keep them coming and we can just ask them live. So make sure that if you have anything you want to ask, um, we can feature it right now. Okay, are you guys ready? Not really. <laughs> okay. But we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> let's get it started. Okay, so let's, <laughs> okay. Um, let's start with the light one. How many different flavors of cheese have been described for the moon? There's got to be a real answer to this. <laughs> it's more than I, one. It's or what you describe one. for the moon? <laughs> oh, gosh. Ooh, definitely Swiss. Yeah. So like how, how many, so like the, the moon it has a lot of holes in it, right? So yeah. how many like very holy cheeses, not H-O-L-Y, the other one. <laughs> how many <laughs> cheeses are that have lots of holes in them? <laughs> Whatever that is. Swiss is the only one I can think of. <laughs> Like so, one. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Do you think we should put the majority of space funding to human space flight? And you can take a second if you'd like. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. As much as I love it and as much as I want to like mess around on Mars, there's just so much like, like exoplanets, like, like whatever cosmologists do. I don't know. I'm a planetary scientist, but all this stuff is just so interesting, right? It's, it's kind of the thing that keeps us going and keeps us interested in, in space flight as well. So. Not to mention it's much cheaper um, <laughs> and a lot less morally dubious to send robots to the planets in the solar system instead of humans. Right. Yeah. Definitely safer. <laughs> and how many of us got into astronomy because of like Hubble photos? Those pretty, pretty pictures. For sure. Okay, next question. And this one came from YouTube. So is there any way to clean up space trash? Hold on, I have a... Uh, I actually had a slide for this that I cut out to make time so I can show you. So there's harpoons, um, there's giant nets, and there's the good old fashioned blowing it up. Um, not, we, we haven't really, um, so that's still a thing that we're still working on. Um, some of these, the, the, har the nets, sorry, um, are still theoretical. China has done the harpooning. India did the blowing up of the, the junk <laughs> and that wasn't fun, um, nor do I recommend it, but there's, there's still stuff like being tested. Um, right now it's just a problem and we're, we're just trying to work on it. Wait, so did the, with the blowing up scenario, did we encounter something like the gravity? movie or a whole actually, bunch of debris <laughs> i actually haven't seen gravity but yeah there was there was a lot of i'm sorry i'm like a bad space nerd because I, I haven't really seen all the science fiction but um there was a lot of concern because like some pieces got like pretty close to like satellites that are functional and some pieces also got close to the iss and if you it like even the tiniest piece of space debris can like bore a hole through that stuff so it was not fun um yeah because like because like one of the important aspects is, you know, once when when you when you blow something up that's 
orbiting Earth at hundreds of kilometers a second, mm -hmm. you blow it up, all the parts are still flying around at hundreds of kilometers a second. And unless they burn up in the atmosphere, which some of them will, then you just have a whole bunch of stuff there that can put a hole in the next rocket to, that we send up. Okay, so next question. Why do so many people have the expectation that other life in the universe would be able to communicate with us? I mean, the easy answer is media, right? We've seen countless TV shows, movies, books, video games, where all the aliens are speaking English, usually with an English accent, right? <laughs> that could be misleading for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, half the Star Trek people are just regular humans painted blue or red or whatever. <laughs> so what is your expectation? Uh, well, I mean, it depends. I mean, most likely it's going to be single celled life forms that we're not going to communicate at all, over, like some amoeba on some sub subsurface ocean somewhere. And if it is, if it is intelligent life, it'll probably be, I don't know, something completely different that we never thought about. Like maybe, I don't know, some sort of squid-like creature, maybe, I don't know. Maybe there's dinosaur type creatures somewhere out there. That's what I want. I want to believe that there's dinosaurs somewhere out in space. That's what I want to believe. Any other comments? Okay, so this one's uh, more geared to one of our panelists specifically. So Flavor Town, how did you get started in this field? Ooh, that's a that's a big one. So um, I've always like when I started college, I started at the University of North Texas, Going Green, um, and I was doing biology and policy. And I originally picked a policy. Um, I'd always wanted to do astrobiology. I've always loved space, um, but I picked a policy because I wanted to like. I noticed that there weren't a lot of people in the STEM classes that like looked like me. And then I started to go through like academia, and then I realized like all the stuff that I was talking about. Um, and so what happened was that internship in the Senate, I was like, it was one of those like intern in DC programs or whatever. And I was like, cool, I'll do that for a semester and I'll come back to UNT and finish my degrees. But I ended up staying because I got more involved, like from like that one uh, internship, my, the Senator that I was working for was like in the science technology, like space committee. And so I was assigned to like all of the like space things. And that was really super cool. And so when I was going to these hearings and when I was like, literally briefing the senator on like the stuff that I was learning. I had, um, at that point I was diving into like so many of the NASA hearings. I was like looking at all the James Webb stuff and like all these different like proposals or whatever. And that's sort of when I got introduced or when I started to get introduced to um, like the Elon Musk type ethical stuff and like, you know, all the colonialism and like all that stuff. And that's when I realized like, whoa, there's like a whole deeper, like with, with, um, injustices in academia and like diversity and stuff like that. Like I was only scratching the surface with what policy and ethics meant in, in space science. And so that I actually, uh, from the Senate, I actually kind of put my science off to the side and I was just running around. I was doing like national security. I was doing like space biodefense. I was doing like all of these different things like related to space. Um, and then I came back and started doing observing. So it was really just sort of like a snowball, like that one internship kind of led me into all these different things. And I, like when the dust settled, I like kind of found myself like at NASA and I, they let me do both, which was super cool. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is a, an interesting question that also came from our YouTube live. Um, what's going to happen first? We find intelligent life or we settle on another planet? Very hypothetical here. <laughs> another planet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not even close. Probably, yeah, I think so. You mind expanding because some people don't know why that might be an easier thing to do to settle on another planet. Well, for me, it comes down to distances. Like the closest star system, well, the closest star that is not the sun is four light years away. So we, even if we could achieve 
light speed travel, it would still take four years for anything to go between those two systems. And we don't even think that there's life or planets in that system, uh, the Alpha Centauri system. Correct me if I'm, I've always known it to be the Alpha Centauri system, but I'm probably yeah. bring up the naming. We thought there was a planet, probably not there, but anyhow, the gist is that it takes so long to even get to a system that we don't even think life is there. It's just, but it is the closest thing. We're probably going to, it's, it's much easier to get to Mars than it is to get to another star. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of space in space. <laughs> that is just the way it is. And, and I guess even for astronomers, it's really hard to like understand the concept of how much space there is in between two objects and galaxies and such. That's but, why you pick up all these nonsense units. So, oh, the units. We yeah, <laughs> all the the astronomer units, magnitude, astronomical units. Okay, yeah, we could go on for a while. But all right. So, <clears throat> if all of the matter in a galaxy came together, would it be able to burn as a star? In the in the entire galaxy. In a galaxy. So. Yeah. See. Let's say the Milky Way, sure. That would just instantaneously form a black hole. Yeah, and the, the, the easy way to think about that is that the galaxy is made out of stars. Um, and so, you know, once you, once you get, um, you, you, you can't get much larger mass in stars than like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm gonna, Screw this up now because I'm tipsy. Um, <laughs> like hundreds or thousands of solar masses. Depending on who you ask. And then once you do that, you're just, you're, you're just too massive to be a star at that point. Right. And there's lots of evidence for this. We think a lot of the supermassive black holes we see, for instance, the center of most galaxies have a supermassive black hole. We think a lot of them might have formed just as a bunch, a clump of gas in the early universe instead of forming a star, there's just so much gas, they're just instantaneously formed a black hole instead. Um, and so there's, there's definitely um, lots of evidence pointing in this direction. So I definitely, if you just took everything in the Milky Way, collapsed down, it would just immediately become a black hole. Great, great, great response. So I have a personal question that I would like each one of the panelists to answer. Um, and I just came up with this, but I would like to know what you think is the coolest object in the universe. And that could be an observable or non-observable. So so I'll, I'll go first because I, I, I have a quick answer. Um, uh, Saturn um, has a hexagon for its, uh, like, like a, has a hexagonal structure in its clouds at its North Pole, I think at least, possibly also at South Pole. Um, and no one knows why it's there. And that's weird. I'm biased because I do study variable stars, but honestly, the more I learn about them, the more I am baffled by variable stars because they're these enormous objects that somehow move with such regularity, like, there are stars that expand and contract on the order of hours and they do it so regularly and in such a way that we could measure them a hundred years ago just using photographic plates. And it is really cool that we live in the same universe as them. <laughs> I'm gonna say population three stars, which are the very first stars to have formed in the, assuming I got my order right, I'm sorry, I'm also several drinks in. Um, I think that's the right order. Population three stars are the very first stars to form in the entire, in the entire universe. And that's where a lot of the elements that we see out in the entire universe comes from. You know, everything that we see from, you know, the gold in, in your necklace or the, the silicone conductors in your smartphone, those basically come from population three stars or the remnants thereof. So that's probably the most important thing. 
I probably have to counter Alex's point. I'm definitely team Jupiter here. Um, just because like it's 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 magnetic field, first of all. It's just like, you know, we, we threw Juno out there and we realized we actually don't know at anything at all about like Jupiter, especially what its magnetic field is doing. It, it is not positioned in the same way that the planet is actually tilted, which is like barely tilted. So I should go more like this. But that, you know, the upwellings and the downwellings, and you know, we we think it's probably hotter on the interior than you know, models can like, you know, suggest. And so I I've always loved Jupiter, but I'm not sure that it's like the most like coolest thing I don't know and just like speaking from like an astrobiologist planetary science perspective like earth come on <laughs> like all of these different like from the formation of our solar system from like the accretion this like all like astro and physics led to chemistry which led to geology and like all of these different processes that we probably and some that we probably don't even know of yet all gave rise to like now we're having zoom calls and you know it, it just always blows my mind to go through like the oranges of life like that so i i you know the, the coolest stuff in the universe are the friends we made along the way now i'm playing but um, i i don't know just i just think thinking about the origins of life and just how good we have it here and how like miraculous almost our existence is i think is is pretty dope Thank you for sharing all your responses. Um, our next question, what is the largest recorded nebula? That's on y'all, I have no idea. <laughs> it depends on how you define nebula. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's that's the route I was gonna go here. So so there, there was um, a really big debate in astronomy in kind of the 19, somewhere between the 20s and the 50s and I probably just offended all the old astronomers out there um but there, there was the, the early end of that range what'd you say the early end of that range the, yeah. the 10s to 20s oh, okay there we go um so there was this there there was what we call the great debate um and so two astronomers basically argued more or less um about whether or not a lot of these uh cloud-like galaxy looking things like what we would call galaxies now were in our galaxy or if they were other galaxies um and they and so because we didn't we didn't know at that point um the these these astronomers ca called these things nebula and so like the andromeda galaxy which is right next which is right next to us and the one that we that everyone was debating about we called it a nebula for forever um, because we didn't know whether or not it was, it was its own thing. And so if, if you found something in your telescope that looked blobby and kind of blue, you generally just called it a nebula. Um, and so from that definition, then, you know, just like probably, probably Andromeda because it was a big galaxy and we knew about it back then. Um, if you consider every galaxy to be a nebula by that definition, then there's bigger galaxies than Andromeda out there. Okay, so um, the next one is, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. Um, one is more like a clarification question because I know I've heard of it before. Um, so this one is, how much is a parsec and is Star Wars using it wrong? <laughs> so parsec, all right, all right, I got this. This is the time for me. <laughs> So a parsec in astronomy basically stands for parallax arc second. So parallax is sort of, if you hold your thumb out, kind of like you did in the WhatsApp segment, I hope everybody held their thumb out. You kind of close one eye and then close the other eye, you'll see your thumb jumping back and forth. This is because the distance between which your eyes will see your thumb at a different angle. Um, and this is what's known as a parallax. So you could use the same with, um, with a planet basically. So if you look at a star, when you're on one side of the sun and then wait six months till Earth is on the other side of the star again, it will look like it's at a different angle in the sky. It's not because the stars moved, but the Earth has moved positions and you're viewing it at a different angle. So it'll look it, like it's a different place relative to the background stars. So this is a parallax. Um, if the parallax between the angle that it seems to change with six months is what's known as one arc second, um, which you, know, you hold your thumb out again, the distance to your thumb is about one degree, 
divide that by 60, that's an arc minute, divide that by 60 again, that's one arc second. So if that angle is one 3,600th of the size of your thumb, then that means that it's shifted by one arc second. You make a, you know the angle, you know how far apart the earth is from the sun, you can make a right angle triangle, figure out how far away the star is. That distance is one parallax arc second or one parsec, which is um, around three point something light years, I think. I don't remember the actual number. I see a lot of fingers flashing. I don't know what that means. Q4, Three at least two. from what I remember. Um, and so that's what a parallax arc second is, par parsec is, this is a measure of distance. George Lucas, when he wrote the original Star Wars, didn't know what parsec was. He just thought it sounded cool. So he said the million falcon did it in like 12 point something parsecs or whatever. And it was kind of like that for a long time. And I know they addressed it in some of the, the books and stuff, but there's so many Star Wars books that I don't, I'm not going to touch those at the moment. I will talk about the um, very underappreciated Star Wars movie, Solo, a Star Wars story, um, which I have the fondness for. And in that case, the, they actually use the parsec correctly because they use it as a measure of distance because the Kessel Run was actually a moving corridor through space that shifts all the time. And Han Solo figured out a shortcut through it, which meant that he could travel it in much shorter distance than most people can normally do. So it was wrong originally, they fixed it in Solo. That's, yeah, that's long, long story short. A whiteboard would have been very helpful, but thank you for that explanation. Yeah, I, you know, I try to make a right angle with my hands, but I only have two hands. <laughs> no, that was great, that was great. Um, okay, for our last question, um, is astronomy becoming more accessible for people with disabilities? For example, people that are blind, people that are deaf. I think so. I think so. I'm seeing, um, there's a lot of like, especially like when you go to museums and stuff like that, a lot more people are being more conscious about like, um, you know, people with disabilities and making a lot of these exhibits um, more accessible. Um, I remember seeing one of, I'm pretty sure it was the Milky Way where they kind of like did raised blocks so that they could kind of feel like the structure of the Milky Way, which I thought was super, super cool. Um, I don't know where it was. I just remember seeing a picture of it. So I think, yes, absolutely. We're making strides. I personally don't think we're making the strides fast enough. Um, but you know, we could we could always do better, of course. But I mean, yeah, I think things are actually absolutely looking up. I can I can share a couple of examples that we're doing. We I'm part of an outreach team here called Deep, um, which is basically use we I lead a team of undergrads to design and build physics astronomy demos for for K through twelve students. One of the demos, a couple of the demos that we're designing this year are all keeping that in mind of making it more accessible for people with who are um, differently able. One of the things we're doing is similar to what Monica said is we're, we're making 3D prints of HST images where the brightness corresponds to the thickness of the plate. So you can feel the different HST images if you have a visual impairment. And then we're also doing um, auditory explanations of astronomy data sets, like um, making the type of star a musical note and then having the distance between stars being, being the spacing between the notes and sort of playing a melody out so you can hear um, data sets that way, or with X plants, doing the same thing, where you make one one thing a note, make one thing the make one thing the loudness, make one thing the space in between them, um, and then sort of explore data sets musically that way. That's Which is all so things cool. that other people have done before, and I'm just shamelessly stole off like YouTube or something. Um, and, but there, yeah, there's there's lots of really great things that people are doing to help to to help um, to help outreach astronomy education to, to, to people with all sorts of abilities. Thank you. Okay, this is our last question. I don't know if I said that for the last one. I'm also kind of tipsy, but <laughs> we, I just saw the YouTube live. So um, the chat, in our lifetime, are we gonna be able to send any probes to exoplanets using space cells, warp drives, EM, EM, electromagnetic drive, anything? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, unless someone has a big breakthrough and we suddenly discover like how to travel long distances in our lifetime, I don't think, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really think so. Not an exoplanet. There is the, there is the Starshot initiative, which could theoretically be done in our lifetime, but 
it'll be towards the tail end of our lifetime. So that's more like a technical yes. Okay. I think that concludes our burning questions panel. And if we didn't get to your question, I'm sorry, but we will definitely take it down and ask it in the future. And thank you so much to our panelists for answering all these questions. They were great. Um, any last remarks? Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right, and now to the thing you've all been waiting for, may have forgotten about because I don't think we remind you that reminded you about it. But trivia, we are going to go over the answers to this month's trivia. And if you did fill it out before now and got a lot of questions right, we will note that down and send you a prize like we did when we were in person. So this month, trivia was about the history of modern astronomy in Hawaii. And as you can see in this picture, there are a lot of observatories on this mountaintop, which is the mountaintop of Mauna Kea. So question one, which of the following led to protests against the construction of the first telescopes on Mauna Kea? Was it lack of public consultation, lack of a clear management process for construction, lack of governmental oversight of the process, or all of the above? It was all of the above. And uh, this work from Dr. Ayokepa Kasumbal Salazar at UT Austin notes that in the 60s and 70s, Native Hawaiians expressed their dissent, quote, in the few public forums available, quote, to them. Question two, William Myron Keck, for whom the Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea are named, is famous for which of the below? Inventing adaptive optics, acquiring a fortune as an oil entrepreneur, observing a catalog of extra galactic objects, or developing segmented mirror telescopes. A thing he shares in common with one of the big funders at, of astronomy at Texas A&M, William Myron Keck, is famous for acquiring a fortune as an oil entrepreneur. At Texas A&M, that distinction goes to, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name now. Well, his first name, Mitchell. <laughs> so, Sylvie, do you remember the name of our office building right now? Um, George Mitchell, there we go. Mitchell. George and Cynthia Mitchell. Physics and astronomy, we got it. Yeah, <laughs> he made his fortune in fracking. So, which is not adjacent to oil, it is oil. Anyhow, question three. According to a paper led by Native Hawaiians on the impact of the 30 meter telescope, you'll often see it as TMT, TMT's construction on Mauna Kea, the construction should be halted because of the need to receive informed consent from Native Hawaiians, astronomy's complicity with state violence against indigenous pr protesters, astronomers' lack of understanding of Hawaiian culture and the history of colonization, or all of the above. It is the one you guessed, all of the above. You can probably come back uh, there to this slide because there is a link to a paper that goes through all of the details that are summarized in this question. Question four. Both the Hawaii State Auditor in 1998 and the 2005 NASA Environmental Impact Statement found Astronomers failed to protect the land granted to them for telescopes in Hawaii. Astronomers abided by the terms of the land lease granted to them for building telescopes in Hawaii. Native Hawaiians support building telescopes on Mauna Kea or all of the above. It is A, 30 years of ast astronomy activity has had a substantial, significant and adverse impact on Mauna Kea. Question five. The Mauna Kea Science Reserve lease from the Department of Land and Natural Resources of the state of Hawaii is set to expire in 2033, 2044, 2055, or 2066. And this is the land that the observatories are built on. It's set to expire in 2033. And you can see 
the boundaries of the reserve laid out here. Question six. In 2015, the Supreme Court of Hawaii invalidated the construction permit for the 30 meter telescope because astronomers failed to complete their plans for construction. <laughs> oh, that's, that's not it. We take a very long time. But hang on. Or protesters successfully blocked construction for long enough. Or the permit had been granted before protesters' pe petitions had been addressed. Or the construction permit was never invalidated. The answer is the permit had been granted before the protesters' petitions had been addressed. And from the Hawaii Supreme Court verdict, quite simply, the board put the cart before the horse when it issued the permit. Question seven. Various astronomers have criticized Native Hawaiian protesters by claiming they are opposed to science, circulating an email with racist language against Native Hawaiians, claiming they are uneducated, or all of the above. Very unfortunately, it is all of the above. This has quite a few, all of this has happened in the very recent past. Question eight. In addition to Mauna Kea, Native communities in the US have opposed which observatories? Mount Graham International Observatory and Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope in orbit, as our names would suggest, McDonald Observatory in Texas and Las Cumbres Observatory in California, or Native communities have never opposed any other observatories aside from those in Hawaii. The answer is Mount Graham and Kitt Peak Observatories, both located in Arizona that you can see pictured here. Question nine, researchers have determined that Native American groups who oppose observatories tend to view them as an attack on their religious beliefs, projects connected to colonialism, scientifically uninteresting, or mostly helpful to their communities. The answer is projects connected to colonialism. And here is a quote from Dr. Leandra Swanner from Harvard University. Science has effectively become an agent of colonization and it is fundamentally indistinguishable from earlier colonization activities. All right, question 10, the last question. James Cook, the first European explorer to establish contact with Hawaii did so on an expedition to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus across the sun in 1769. He also had sealed orders to look for the Northwest Passage, look for India, since Columbus had failed to find it, look for Australia, which Europeans believed was rich in resources, or look for evidence of extraterrestrials in the Pacific Ocean. The answer is, Look for Australia, which Europeans believe was rich in resources. And you can look at this other, actually I'm not sure if it's the same one, I'm to forgive me, but either way, this paper that you can access at the link here contains the statement, astronomy and colonization have been entwined in the Pacific since first contact as you can see with this example of James Cook here. So yeah, would strongly encourage people to look at the links highlighted in this presentation. Goodness knows that astronomers don't really learn about this stuff and we honestly should, because especially in the US, like I know I use data that was taken from telescopes in Hawaii and it's, yeah. I was going to say, our science comes from all of these telescopes, and we don't know the, the historical significance behind them or anything. So this is incredibly important for scientists as people that are enjoying the science. So, yep. right, Before we let you go, at the end of the last Astronomy on Tap BCS of the year, we're going to go through announcements again. We are still doing trivia, so come back next month. <laughs> And if you win, we will get your contact info and send you a prize. 
Okay, and once again, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And remember that these are recorded so you can go back and look at the old Astronomy on Taps that we've had and this one that's happening right now. And you can share with your friends. And um, when you subscribe, you get messages for the upcoming Astronomy on Taps. So follow us on other social media, not just YouTube. On Twitter, we are AOT underscore BCS. And on Facebook and Instagram, we are AOT BCS. And you can go to astronomyontap.org slash events to keep up to date on other astronomy on taps across the world. There are a lot. And also help support the place that has supported us. And that is the Grand Stafford Theater. And you can Venmo at jose-quintana-20. Um, put Stafford tip in order to tip the bartenders and support that place. If you'd like to donate to us, you can find us on Venmo and Cash App at AOT BCS. And $15 will get you an AOT BCS t-shirt featuring the lovely space traveler that you see pictured here. And our next event is January 20th, 2021. And wow, 2021. And that is, if you forget, it's always the third Wednesday of every month. Um, and also, if you follow us on our social media, you will be um, updated about when this is going to happen next. So make sure to do that and come to our next event and learn astronomy with us. And thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you all for coming out again. Last Astronomy on Tap BCS of 2020. Good riddance yes. again. <laughs> happy holidays, everyone, and thank you so much for viewing and supporting us, and thank you to the panelists and the speakers. We have such a good time here on Astronomy on Tap. All right, take care, everyone. And see you next time. <laughs>